Love Actually, from Wikipedia, the free online encyclopedia, available at en.wikipedia.org. Love Actually is a 2003 British romantic comedy film written and directed by Richard Curtis. The screenplay delves into different aspects of love as shown through stories involving a wide variety of individuals, many of whom are linked as their tales progress. The ensemble cast is composed of predominantly English actors. The film begins five weeks before Christmas and is played out during a week-by-week -week countdown until the holiday, with an epilogue that takes place one month later. The following is an info box which accompanies this article and gives a summary of the main information about Love Actually to supplement the arrangement of information in this article. Love Actually info box. A picture is included in this part of the article. It shows a promotional poster for the movie. Love Actually. Directed by Richard Curtis, produced by Tim Bevan, Lisa Chazen, Eric Felliner, Deborah Hayward, Duncan Kenworthy. Written by Richard Curtis, starring Alan Rickman, Bill Nye, Colin Firth, Emma Thompson, Hugh Grant, Liam Neeson, Kira Knightley, Rowan Atkinson. Distributed by Universal Pictures. Release date, 6th of November 2003. Running time, 135 minutes. Country, United Kingdom. Language, English. Contents. Section 1. Cast of characters and storylines. Section 1.1. Billy, Mac and Joe. Section 1.2. Juliet, Peter and Mark. Section 1.3. Jamie and Aurelia. Section 1.4. Harry, Karen and Maya. Section 1.5. David and Natalie. Section 1.6. Daniel and Carol, Sam and Joanna. Section 1.7. Sarah and Carol. Section 1.8. Colin, Tony and the Wisconsin Girls. Section 1.9. John and Judy. Section 1.10. Rufus. Section 2. Production Notes. Section 3. Principal Cast. Section 4. Soundtrack. Section 5. Critical Reception. Section 6. Awards and Nominations. Section 1. Cast of Characters and Storylines. The film begins with a voiceover from David, Hugh Grant, commenting that, whenever he gets gloomy with the state of the world, he thinks about the arrivals terminal at Heathrow Airport, and the pure, uncomplicated love felt as friends and families welcome their arriving loved ones. David's voiceover also relates that all the known messages left by the people who died on the 9-11 planes were messages of love and not hate. The film then tells the love stories of many people, culminating in a final scene at the airport enacted to the tune of the Beach Boys, God Only Knows, that closes their stories. The film ends with a montage of anonymous persons greeting their arriving loved ones that slowly enlarges and fills the screen, eventually forming the shape of a heart. Section 1.1 .1, Billy Mac and Joe With the help of his longtime manager Joe, Gregor Fisher, aging rock and roll legend Billy Mac, Bill Nye, records a Christmas variation of the drug's classic hit, Love Is All Around. Despite his honest admission that it is a festering third of a record, the singer promotes the release in the hope that it will become the Christmas number one single. During his publicity tour, Billy repeatedly causes Joe grief by pulling stunts such as defacing a poster of rival musicians Blue with a speech bubble reading, We've Got Little Pricks. He also promises to perform his song Naked on television should it hit the top spot, and he keeps his word, albeit while wearing boots and holding a strategically placed guitar when it does. After briefly celebrating his victory at a party hosted by Sir Elton John, Billy unexpectedly arrives at Joe's flat and explains that Christmas is a time to be with the people you love and that he has just realised that the people I love is you. Despite simultaneously hitting Joe with insulting comments about his weight, he reminds Joe that we have had a wonderful ride touring around the world together over the years and he suggests that the two celebrate Christmas by getting drunk and watching porn. Billy and Joe's story is the only one exploring platonic love and the two characters are unrelated to any of the other characters in the film, although a few of the other characters are shown watching Billy Mac on their TVs or listening to his song on the radio. At the end of the film, Billy Mac arrives at the airport terminal with a gorgeous six-foot blonde woman pushing his luggage cart. 
he refers to her as one of two and possibly more new girlfriends, indicating his career has taken a turn for the better. Joe is there to greet him and their friendly relationship remains solid. Section 1.2 Juliet, Peter and Mark Juliet, Kira Knightley, and Peter, Joetta Edgefor, are wed in a lovely ceremony orchestrated and videotaped by Mark, Andrew Lincoln, Peter's best friend and best man. When the professional wedding video turns out to be dreadful, Juliet shows up at Mark's door in the hopes of getting a copy of his footage, despite the fact that he has always been cold and unfriendly to her. The video turns out to consist entirely of close-ups of her, and she realises that he secretly has had feelings for her. Mortified, Mark explains that his coldness to her is a self-preservation thing and excuses himself. On Christmas Eve, Mark shows up at Juliet and Peter's door posing as a carol singer with a portable CD player and uses a series of cardboard signs to silently tell her that At Christmas you tell the truth and Without hope or agenda, to me you are perfect. As he leaves, Juliet runs after him and kisses him before returning to Peter. Mark tells himself, Enough, enough now perhaps acknowledging that it's time to move on with his life. All three appear at the airport in the closing scenes to greet Jamie and Aurelia, showing that the friendship between Peter and Mark has not been affected by the latter's feelings for Juliet. Section 1.3 Jamie and Aurelia Writer Jamie, Colin Firth, first appears preparing to attend Juliet and Peter's wedding. His girlfriend, Sienna Guillory, misses the ceremony allegedly due to illness, but when Jamie unexpectedly returns home before the reception, he discovers her engaging in sexual relations with his brother. Heartbroken, Jamie retires to the solitude of his French cottage to immerse himself in his writing. Here he meets Portuguese housekeeper Aurelia, Lucia Moniz, who speaks only her native tongue. Despite the language barrier, they manage to communicate with each other, with subtitles indicating they are at times in agreement with each other and sometimes of opposite minds. Jamie returns to London, where he takes a course in Portuguese. On Christmas Eve, he decides to ditch celebrations with his family to fly to Marseille. In the crowded Portuguese restaurant where Aurelia works her second job as a waitress, he proposes to her in his mangled Portuguese, and she accepts using her recently learned English. The film ends with Jamie and Aurelia now engaged. At the airport, they are met by Peter, Juliet, and Mark. Aurelia jokes that if Jamie had told her his friends were so handsome, she might have chosen a different Englishman. Jamie then jokes that she doesn't properly speak English well and doesn't know what she's saying. Section 1.4 Harry, Karen and Maya Harry, Alan Rickman, is the managing director of a design agency. Maya, Heike McCatch, his new secretary, clearly has designs on him. His nascent midlife crisis allows him tentatively to welcome her attention, and for Christmas he buys her an expensive necklace from jewellery salesman Rufus, Rowan Atkinson, who takes a very long time adding ever more elaborate wrapping, while Harry becomes increasingly nervous with the fear of detection. Meanwhile, Harry's wife Karen, Emma Thompson, is busy dealing with their children, Daisy, Lulu Popplewell, and Bernard, William Wadham, who are appearing in the school nativity, her brother David, and her friend Daniel, who has just lost his wife to cancer. Karen discovers the necklace in Harry's coat pocket and assumes it is a gift for her, only to be given the CD, Joni Mitchell's Both Sides Now, to continue Karen's emotional education, as Harry puts it, instead. She immediately understands Harry is having an affair and briefly breaks down alone in the bedroom before composing herself to attend the children's play with her husband. Following the play, Karen confronts Harry, who admits, I am so in the wrong, a classic fool, to which Karen replies, Yes, but you've also made a fool out of me. You've made the life I lead foolish too before blinking back tears and enthusiastically congratulating their children. As for Maya, she is shown smiling while trying on the necklace. In the final airport scene, Harry returns home from a trip abroad and Harn and his children are there to greet him. Harry is delighted to see his kids again, his exchange with Karen is more perfunctory, but suggests that, though the two are not on steady terms, they intend to give their marriage a chance. Section 1.5 David and Natalie Karen's brother, the recently elected British Prime Minister David, Hugh Grant, is young, handsome and single. Natalie, Martin McCutcheon, is a new junior member of the household staff at 10 Downing Street and regularly serves his tea and biscuits. Something seems to click between them, but with the exemption of some mild flirting, neither pursues the attraction. When the President of the United States, Billy Bob Thornton, pays a visit, his conservative attitude and flat refusal to relax any policies leave the British advisor stimmied. It is only after David walks in to find the President attempting to seduce Natalie that he stands up for the UK at a nationally televised press conference, saying Britain is a great country for things like Harry Potter, the Beatles, and David Beckham's right foot. David Beckham's left foot, come to that. 
and embarrassing the president by saying that a friend who bullies us is no longer a friend. Concerned that his affections for Natalie are affecting his political judgment, David asks for her to be redistributed. Later, while looking through a sampling of Christmas cards, David comes across a card signed, I'm actually yours, with love, your Natalie. Encouraged by this, he sets out to find her. After much doorbell ringing, including a ring at Maya's house, David eventually finds Natalie at her family's home. Hoping to have some time with Natalie, David offers to drive everyone to a local school for the play, the same one in which his niece and nephew are appearing, as he realises only when his sister, Karen, still unsteady from her recent discovery of her husband's affair, spots him and thanks him for finally managing to come to a family function. The two watch the show from backstage, and their budding relationship is exposed to the audience when a curtain at the rear of the stage is raised during the big finale, and David and Natalie are caught in a passionate kiss. Undeterred, they smile and wave. In the final airport scene, as David walks through the gate of the airport in the finale, Natalie, heedless of the surrounding paparazzi, runs straight through his entourage and leaps into his arms, planting a big kiss on him. Section 1.6 Daniel and Carol, Sam and Joanna Daniel, Liam Neeson, Karen's friend, is introduced in the film during a funeral for his wife Joanna. Her death, caused by an unspecified long-term illness, has left Daniel and his steps on Sam, Thomas Sangster, to fend for themselves. Daniel must deal with his sudden responsibility as well as the perceived end of his love life. That was a done deal long ago, he says to Sam, unless, of course, Claudia Schiffer calls, in which case I want you out of the house straight away, you wee motherless mongrel. Sam, too, is especially forlorn about something, eventually revealing that he is now in love with an American girl from his school, also named Joanna, Olivia Olsen, who he assumes does not know he exists. After seeing Billy Mac's new video in the store window, he comes up with a plan, based on the premise that girls love musicians, even the really weird ones get girlfriends. With Daniel's encouragement, Sam teaches himself to play the drums, eventually acting as top for Joanna's performance of All I Want for Christmas Is You at the Borough Wide School play. Unfortunately, Sam's drumming fails to secure Joanna's attention the way he had hoped. After the play, Daniel consoles Sam, who is also heartbroken over recent news of Joanna's return to the United States, and convinces him to go catch Joanna at the airport. While Sam dashes off to collect his things, Daniel bumps into another parent, Carol, played by Claudia Schiffer, and sparks immediately fly. Sam and Daniel leave to find Joanna before she and her family board their flight to America. Once Daniel and Sam arrive, the attendant refuses to let Sam through. However, while the attendant is distracted by another passenger, the jewellery clerk Rufus, Sam is able to sneak through and race past the security checkpoint. With the gate staff distracted by Billy Back's promised naked performance on TV monitors, Sam is able to reach Joanna and confess his love to her just as she is about to board the plane. He is brought back to his stepfather by security guards, but Joanna runs back to Sam to give him a kiss on the cheek. In triumph, he leaps into Daniel's arms. In the finale, Daniel and Sam have returned to the airport with Carol and her son, as Sam awaits Joanna's return. When Joanna walks through the doors, Sam says, Hello, restraining the impulse to embrace her. Daniel curses he should have kissed her, but Carol soothes him. No, that's cool. Section 1.7 Sarah and Carol Sarah, Laura Linney, first appears at the wedding of Juliet and Peter, sitting next to our friend Jamie. We learn she works at Harry's graphic design company and has been in love for years with the creative director Carol, Rodrigo Santoro, a not-so-secret obsession recognised by Harry, who implores her to say something to him since it's Christmas and Carol is aware of her feelings anyway. Unfortunately for all concerned, Sarah has an institutionalised and mentally ill brother who calls her mobile phone incessantly. Sarah feels responsible for her brother and constantly puts her life on hold to support him. Sarah's chance at making love with Carol, following her company's Christmas party, hosted at an art gallery run by Mark, is abandoned when her brother again calls her at the most inopportune time. Carol suggests that she not answer, asking, will it make him any better? But she does so anyway, effectively ending their relationship. On Christmas Eve, she wishes Carol Merry Christmas as he leaves the office, and it is clear he wants to say something to her, but he departs and she breaks down in tears before picking up her phone to ring her brother. She is seen spending Christmas in her brother's institution, wrapping a scarf around him. They are the only couple not seen at the end of the movie at the airport. Section 1.8 Colin, Tony and the Wisconsin Girls After several blunders attempting to woo various English women, including Maya and the caterer at Juliet and Peter's wedding, Colin Frissell, Chris Marshall, informs his friend Tony, Abdul Salis, he plans to go to America and find love there because, in his estimation, the US is filled to the brim with gorgeous women who will fall head over heels for him because of his cute British accent. Stateside and Prince William, without the weird family. The first place he goes after landing in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, is an average American bar where he meets three stunningly attractive women, Ivana Milchevic, 
January Jones and Elisha Cuthbert, who, after falling for his basilded accent, invite him to stay at their home, specifically in their bed, with them and their housemate Harriet, Shannon Elizabeth, the sexy one. They warn him that, because they are poor, they can't even afford pyjamas, so everyone will be naked. In the finale, a much cooler and more suave Colin returns to England with Harriet, the fourth Wisconsin girl, for himself, and her sister, Carla, Denise Richards, who came on the flight to meet Tony. At the airport, Carla embraces and kisses a startled Tony, and tells him that, I heard that you were gorgeous. Section 1.9 John and Judy In a story that was excised completely from the censored version of the DVD release of the film, John, Martin Freeman, and Judy, Joanna Page, who up to this point were unknown to each other, work as stand-ins for the sex scenes in a movie. Colin's friend Tony is part of the film crew, and gives them directions as to the activities they should simulate so that lighting checks and such can be completed before the actors are called to the set. Despite their blatantly sexual actions and frequent nudity, they are very naturally comfortable with each other, discussing politics, traffic, and previous jobs as if they'd known one another for years. John even tells Judy that, it is nice to have someone I can just chat with. The two carefully and cautiously pursue a relationship and see the play at a local school together with John's brother. In the finale at the airport, Tony, while waiting for Colin, runs into John and Judy, about to depart on a trip together. Judy happily displays an engagement ring on her finger. Section 1.10 Rufus Rufus is a minor but significant character played by Rowan Atkinson. He is a self reduced jewellery salesman whose obsessive attention to his gift wrapping nearly gets Harry caught buying Maya's necklace, and later at the airport he purposely distracts an attendant so that Sam can sneak through security and see Joanna before she goes back to America. In the original script, the character was revealed to be an angel, and the airport scene showed him disappearing as he walked through the crowd, but this aspect of the character was removed. Richard Curtis says that with all the storylines already complicating the movie, the idea of introducing another layer of supernatural beings seemed over the top. Section 2. Production Notes The working title film's production, budgeted at $45 million, was released by Universal Pictures. It grossed $62,671,632 in the United Kingdom, $13,956,93 in Australia, and $59,472,278 in the US and Canada. It took a worldwide total of $247,472,278. Most of the movie was filmed on location in London, at sites including Trafalgar Square, the Central Court of Somerset House in the Strand, Grosvenor's Chapel in South Audley Street near Hyde Park, St Paul's Clapham on Rectory Grove, Clapham in the London Borough of Lambeth, the Millennium Bridge, Selfridge's Department Store on Oxford Street, Lambeth Bridge, the Tate Modern in the former Bankside Power Station, Canary Wharf, Marble Arch, the St Luke's Mews off All Saints Road in Notting Hill, Chelsea Bridge, the Oxo Tower, London City Hall, Poplar Road in Herne Hill in the London Borough of Lambeth, Elliot School in Pullman Gardens, Putney in the London Borough of Wandsworth, and London Heathrow Airport. Additional scenes were filmed at the Marseille Airport and Le Bar de la Marine. Scenes set in 10 Downing Street were filmed in Shepperton Studios. The scene in which Colin attempts to chat up the female caterer at the wedding appeared in drafts of the screenplay for Four Weddings and a Funeral, but was cut from the final version. Veteran actress Jean Moreau is seen briefly waiting for a taxi at the Marseille airport. Soul singer Ruby Turner appears as Joanne Anderson's mother, one of the backup singers at the school Christmas pageant. After the resignation of PM Tony Blair, pundits and speculators refer to the potential anti-American shift in Gordon Brown's cabinet as a Love Actually moment referencing the scene in which Hugh Grant's character stands up to the American president. In 2009, during President Barack Obama's first visit to the UK, Chris Matthews referred to the president in Love Actually as an exemplar of George W. Bush and other former presidents bullying of European allies, in contrast with Obama's more cooperative, respectful style. Section 3. Principal Cast Alan Rickman plays Harry Emma Thompson plays Karen Hugh Grant plays David Martine McCutcheon plays Natalie. Colin Firth plays Jamie. Luthia Moniz plays Aurelia. Liam Neeson plays Daniel. Thomas Sangster plays Sam. Kira Knightley plays Juliet. Chavetel Ejivhar plays David. Andrew Lincoln plays Mark. Laura Lenny plays Sarah. Rodrigo Santoro plays Carol. Bill Nye plays Billy Mack. Gregor Fisher plays Joe. Chris Marshall plays Colin. Abdul Salis plays Tony. 
Heike McCatch plays Maya. Martin Freeman plays John. Joanna Page plays Judy. Olivia Olson plays Joanna. Billy Bob Thornton plays the President of the United States. Rowan Atkinson plays Rufus. Claudia Schiffer plays Carol. Ivana Milchevic plays Stacy. January Jones plays Jeannie. Alicia Cuthbert plays Carol Ann. Shannon Elizabeth plays Harriet. Denise Richards plays Carla. Lulu Popplewell plays Daisy. Marcus Bridgestoke plays Mikey. Section 4. Soundtrack. The film's original music was composed, orchestrated and conducted by Craig Armstrong. The soundtrack album reached the top 40 of the US Billboard 200 in 2004 and ranked number 2 on the soundtrack album chart. It also achieved gold record status in Australia and Mexico. Songs heard on the soundtrack include The Trouble with Love Is by Kelly Clarkson Here With Me by Dido Sweetest Goodbye Sunday Morning by Maroon 5 Turn Me On by Nora Jones Take Me As I Am by Wycliffe John and Charissa Songbird by Eva Cassidy Wherever You Will Go by The Calling Jump For My Love by The Pointer Sisters Both Sides Now by Joni Mitchell All You Need Is Love by Lyndon David Hull God Only Knows by The Beach Boys I'll See It Through by Texas Too Lost In You by Sugar Babes White Christmas by Otis Redding Songs and Director's Cuts Joanna by Scott Walker The UK release of the soundtrack features an additional score track by Craig Armstrong, PM's Love Theme, and sometimes performed by Gabrielle. However, it does not include Wherever You Will Go by The Calling. The US disc replaced the Girls Aloud version of Jump with the Pointer Sisters' original recording. Craig Armstrong's song Glasgow Love Theme was also used in the movie but did not appear on the soundtrack. All I Want for Christmas Is You was written and originally recorded by Mariah Carey. Although they were not included on the soundtrack album, the Paul Anka song Puppy Love, performed by S Club Juniors, and Bye Bye Baby by the Bay City Rollers are heard in the film. Section 5. Critical Reception Upon its release, the film received generally positive reviews. In his review in the New York Times, A. O. Scott called it a romantic comedy swollen to the length of an oscar trolling epic, nearly two and a quarter hours of cheekiness, diffidence and high-toned smirking, and added, it is more like a record label's greatest hits compilation or a very special sitcom clip reel show than an actual movie. The film's governing idea of love is both shallow and dishonest, and its sweet, chipper demeanour masks a sour cynicism about human emotions that is all the more sleazy for remaining unacknowledged. It has the callous, leading soul of an early 60s Rat Pack comedy, but without the suave, seductive bravado. Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times described it as a belly flop into the sea of a romantic comedy. The movie's only flaw is also a virtue. It's jammed with characters, stories, warmth and laughs, until at times Curtis seems to be working from a checklist of obligatory movie love situations and doesn't want to leave anything out. It feels a little like a gourmet meal that turns into a hot dog eating contest. Susan Volschinia of USA Today stated, Curtis' multi-tiered cake of comedy, slathered in eye candy icing and set mostly in London at Christmas, serves sundry slices of love, sad, sweet and silly, in all of their messy, often surprising glory. Carla Mayer of the San Francisco Chronicle opened, It abandons any pretext of sophistication for gloppy sentimentality, sugary pop songs and body humour, an approach that works about half the time. Most of the storylines maintain interest because of the fine cast and general goodwill of the picture. Owen Gleiberman of Entertainment Weekly rated it B and called it a toasty, star-packed ensemble comedy that's going to make a lot of holiday romances feel very, very good. Watching it, I felt cosy and charmed myself. In Rolling Stone, Peter Travers rated it two stars out of a possible four, saying, There are laughs laced with feelings here, but the deaf screenwriter Richard Curtis dilutes the impact by tossing in more and more stories. As a director, Curtis can't seem to rein in his writer. He ladles sugar over the eager to please love actually to make it go down easy, forgetting that sometimes it just makes you gag. New Pierce of the BBC awarded it four of a possible five stars and called it a vibrant romantic comedy. Warm, bittersweet and hilarious. This is love, actually. Prepare to be smitten. Todd McCarthy of Variety called it a roundly entertaining romantic comedy, a doggedly cheery confection and a package that feels as luxuriously appointed and expertly tooled as a Rolls Royce and predicted its cheeky wit, impossibly attractive cast and sure-handed professionalism along with its all-encompassing romanticism should make this a highly popular early holiday attraction for adults on both sides of the pond. Michael Atkinson of The Village Voice called it 
Love British style, handicapped slightly by corny circumstances and populated by colourful neurotics. Section 6. Awards and Nominations Alexander Corda Award for Best British Film, Nominee BAFTA Award for Best Actor in a Supporting Role, Bill Nye, Winner BAFTA Award for Best Actress in a Supporting Role, Emma Thompson, Nominee Golden Globe Award for Best Motion Picture, Musical or Comedy, Nominee Golden Globe Award for Best Screenplay, Nominee Empire Award for Best British Film, Winner Empire Award for Best British Actress, Emma Thompson, Winner Empire Award for Best Newcomer, Martin McCutcheon, Winner Empire Accord for Best Newcomer, Andrew Lincoln, Nominee Evening Standard British Film Award for Best Actress, Emma Thompson, Winner Evening Standard Peter Sellers Award for Comedy, Bill Nye, Winner European Film Award for Best Actor, Hugh Grant, Nominee European Film Award for Best Director, Richard Curtis, Nominee London Film Critics Circle Award for Best British Supporting Actor, Bill Nye, Winner London Film Critics Circle Award for Best British Supporting Actress, Emma Thompson, Winner Los Angeles Film Critics Association Award for Best Supporting Actor, Bill Nye, Winner Satellite Award for Best Supporting Actor, Musical or Comedy, Bill Nye and Thomas Sangster, Nominees Satellite Award for Best Supporting Actress, Musical or Comedy, Emma Thompson, Nominee there are references available in the written form of this article. Please be sure to verify information found on Wikipedia using the references provided or cross-referencing the information yourself. This sound file and all text in the article are licensed under the GNU Free Documentation License, available at www.gnu.org forward slash copy left forward slash fdl.html.